Welcome to The Way, and welcome to Chat and Chew Sunday. Each fifth Sunday, we gather after 11 a.m. service for lunch and deeper conversation. So stick around. We'll be talking with our live group leaders and digging deeper into our new series, Ties That Bind. Plan to join us for a great meal and a chance to connect with people. Our Charged Up ministry for teens is back. Charged Up is a fun, real talk, interactive small group for teens that will take place every Sunday during 11 a.m. service. So bring every teen that you know, your niece or nephew, family, friend, or neighbor. They are all welcome to join us as we discover how to follow Jesus and be on fire for Him. To kick off the comeback of Charged Up, there will be an amazing game night this Friday, October 4th at 7 p.m. here at The Way. Help us spread the word and help the teens in your life be a part of Charged Up. Showers of Blessings is back, and we are currently collecting sleeping bags for our next outreach. Please donate a new or gently used sleeping bag by the first Sunday of October, next Sunday. Or you can donate $10. You can make a note on your offering envelope or through the app to indicate that the money is for showers of blessings. And mark your calendars. October 13th, after second service, we will be hosting a Woke Not Broke seminar. Learn strategies to save, build credit, get out of debt, and build wealth, and ask your financial question. Educator, entrepreneur, and artist Jermaine Hughes and wealth manager Cameron Hackett will be leading the seminar. Thanks for joining us today at The Way. Now I'm going to invite our... Uh, let's see, our live group leaders that are here in worship to come and join me on stage. So I see Brother Matt, I see uh, Delia, I see Florence, I see Sister Daisy, Wayne. Y'all come on up here. Put your hands together for them, everybody, as they come and join us on stage. We're going to talk a little bit about our small groups. Feel free to have a seat anywhere, anywhere. There you go. Take a mic, take a mic, take a mic. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. And so we are excited because we are prepared to launch a whole new series called The Ties That Bind. And uh, this series is a, a small group series. Every year during the fall, we try to do a church-wide. Everybody say church-wide. So in it, all right, that was very uh, meager, meek. <laughs> that sounded like half a church-wide. Everybody say church-wide. All right, that sounded at least like 90%. All right, a church-wide series where we do preaching from the stage that is connected to uh, us meeting throughout the week, at least one day with groups of people uh, in our uh, cafe, some meet at home, some meet here at the church, uh, for a seven, eight-week process to help us be able, oh, that's first lady, that's my wife, amen. Thank God for my wife. Um, uh, church-wide, everybody say church-wide. church-wide. All right, here we go. All right, church-wide. So part of what we do is, as our church grows, how many of you can appreciate that you can be a part of a big crowd and be unknown and unseen? And our desire is not to have a growing church right now, We have two services that are pretty full, which kind of means we kind of already have two congregations, people that don't know each other, uh, about several hundred people gathering with us per week. And and we are trying to make sure that as a church, we can all be on the same page and in relationships, meaningful relationships with one another that are healthy. And we thought that it would be important for us as a practice every fall to do a church-wide small group Bible study, preaching series, so at least for a few months, all of us can be doing the same thing and talking about the same thing and hopefully building deeper relationships one with another. And so we have about 10 groups of uh, folks that meet throughout the week on particular days and times and locations, and we wanted to at least bring a good cross-section of them up so you can hear a little bit about them and their group, and then at our chat and chew after service, we're actually going to spend a lot more time going deeper into what we hope to accomplish with the group itself. 
But we thought it'd be great for you all to at least meet some of our small group leaders as we launch this series. So we'll start with Minister Wayne and just go down. Tell us your name, how long you've been at the way, and where you're from. Good morning, everybody. I'm Minister Wayne. Um, been at the way for almost five years now, and I'm from Oakland, California. Oak Town in the house, all right? My name is Sister Daisy Hill, and I've been here about 12 or 13 years, and I'm from San Francisco. Yes, yes, yes. We, the unicorns. <laughs> My name is Delia. I've been at The Way for almost four years now. Um, originally from the West Indies, grew up in Indiana, and now I live here. Yes. I'm Florence, and I've been at The Way about three years, and I'm originally from the island of Bermuda. I've been living in uh, Richmond for 30 something years. Wow, that, that counts. Hey, man, that's a long time. So I'm from here now. <laughs> I'm Matt. Uh, I live in San Francisco for I've lived in San Francisco for the last eight years, but originally from Malaysia, um, and I've been coming to the Way for two to three years now. Amen. Clap it up for all these small group leaders, everybody. All right, and so we have groups that meet throughout the week, different days of the week, and different times, and many of the groups uh, that are led by these wonderful people have a certain kind of affinity. A, a, a group um, focus or just kind of a general focus. So we thought we'd at least give you a chance to hear a little bit of what their group does and when they meet. And so we'll start with Wayne again. Just tell us again where your groups meet and what time. And some of that is on the screen, although it's a little hard to read when you get down to the right hand corner. So let me make that out while they're talking. I can tell you what it say. Minister Wayne. Okay, so the men, we meet at um, 7 here on Mondays. Um, we, we watch a little bit of football, and then we get into some great conversation. Um, I'm excited about this, 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 this series because most of us as men don't get to talk about healthy relationships. We, don't, we haven't been taught about healthy relationships, so I'm, I'm excited about this series. All right, and, and y'all meet during Monday Night Football? Yes. Monday Night Football. Yep. So if you want to come join Monday Night Football, fellas, you'll have food and fellowship, and they start meeting doing their Bible lesson around halftime, all right? So you'll get like a good 20 minutes of halftime, then maybe the next 10 minutes of the first, third quarter. And if the game, I mean, if the, if the study is better than the game, then y'all just go right on through. But if the game's good. We let the Holy Spirit lead that moment. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Let's get Pastor Tanisha in the queue. Hi, everybody. That guy. Um, hi. Um, I am going to lead a small group, a live group, uh, just for our 18 to 25-year-olds, and it's called Adulting 101. Mm. It's going to be amazing. Is there going to be? Y'all not, uh, yeah, not only invited. in the age bracket. How many want a 19 to 50-year-old <laughs> Adulting 101? Anybody? So if you remember back on your 18 to 25 years and owe the guidance that could have transpired, um, so many heartaches and roadblocks we could have <laughs> steered away if we had like a focus group. So we intend on um, focusing on relationships, focusing on just our fundamentals. A lot of uh, this age group didn't go to Sunday school. So this is like a great fundamental with how we can connect with God and then learn how to connect with our relationships, our finances, how to write a check, how to open a <laughs> car, you know, car insurance. We're just going to do everything you need, your toolkit to start life. Now, we do have a lot of Cal students, so I want to open this up to people who may not be at Cal and you're looking for a place, you're, you're college age or you go to another school, you just want a place to plug in. We will be meeting here on Tuesday nights at 7, here Tuesday night at 7, um, not this week, the second week of October. See you there. All yeah. right, clap it up for Adulting 101. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. All right, Sister Daisy. Okay, my group is the Women of the Way, and we meet on, fr <laughs> <laughs> we meet on Friday, 6.30 to 8 o'clock. And in our group, we are focused on uh, building relationships, and we are in relationship. Mm. And um, Pastor always talks about how we cannot survive on one day of service. Mm. So we need to be here. So that's one of the uh, issues and models that we go from. And we work on uh, ourselves individually. We pour into each other. 
and we encourage each other within our groups. Clap it up for them. And they, the, the, the women's group is the longest running uninterrupted group. They don't stop during our off seasons. They're kind of like the original Ethiop Ethiopian Coptic church. They just <laughs> been running since the beginning of the church. And we thank God for them in the name of the Lord. All right, Sister Delia. Hi, so I co-lead the West Oakland Live group with Robin, uh, who will be here during chat and shoot. Don't need to live in West Oakland to join us, so if Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Uh, works for you, we'd love to have you. Um, sometimes we meet off of 34th and San Pablo, sometimes off of 19th, we fluctuate between my home and Robin's home. And so our group is really about just being in deep community with each other, like an extension of the um, sparks to start on Sunday and like how do we deepen those relationships with each other and um, you know use the whatever the subject is for the live group to drive those relationships but we also really love to meet outside of the live group time as well we actually just had a picnic on Lake Merritt on Saturday which was really nice so just wow. showing up for each other and being in deep community and letting that um, just flow out to other people in our lives as well and back into the group and we are going to start meeting this Tuesday at 7 but if you can't join until um, later when like official launches are starting like please do join then as well clap it up for the West Oakland live group <laughs> all right sister Flo. hi and I'm Florence and I am actually a mentee of pastor uh, Erna our fusion group meets on Wednesday at 7 and we welcome everyone we've had like a core group but it tends to be a group where others kind of come and go and come. And um, so we have a core group who are kind of in relationship and meet outside of um, the Wednesday night. Um, but I think our group is where we hope to welcome everyone who hasn't kind of joined mm -hmm. another group on time or you're always welcome to Fusion. Yes, and it's, it's worth saying the Wednesday night Fusion group is always an open invitation, as she's been saying. So you may feel like, you know, I travel a lot or uh, I didn't get in early enough. Coming Wednesday night, every Wednesday night at 7 p.m., you'll always find Pastor Ernest, Sister Florence, and a number of folks ready to welcome and provide community for all of you and all of us that are here. Now, while I have you on stage, I'd love for you to talk about the Belong Project, the Belong all Circle, right. because Sister Florence and my sister Michelle, Mother Michelle, have been leading this great or participating in this great project around expanding belonging. Can you just say a few moments, minutes right, about that? So, um, the belong movement here in um, is a part of Faith in Action East Bay, which is one of the PICO um, federations and um, um, has lots of campaigns, the belong movement being one and um, we were trained as facilitators, Michelle and Sharon and I. <laughs> oh, there she is. <laughs> back hey, Mom. In, um, <laughs> back in March. Um, and Michelle and I have been in the same group till now. It's four meetings that we have that um, are specifically facilitated to um, make it a safe place to share our stories, basically. And that's. Um, where we really get to know other people with different passions around like immigration issues, um, violence, and um, from there I think most of us have been inspired by each other's story to join some of the other PICO um, campaigns like the um, Live Free campaign, um, they have currently a big one is um, Schools and Communities First around education um, anyway, I've been re-inspired, I would say, to become even more active, not just in my head, but tangibly. Mm. <laughs> um, and I want to encourage um, everyone here to know that we are starting to facilitate the, ju the Justice and Mercy Ministry. Um, I'll be doing f the next four sessions, Belong Circle style. Yes. I'll be leading that, and it, you don't have to be a member of Justice and Mercy to decide to come. I think, I'm not sure if it's the 12th, whatever the, the 13th. Second, no, the second the sec Sunday. Second Sunday of each month. Right. Um, so, 
Welcome. Yes. How many of you care about justice issues around education, around ending violence? Look at all these hands, right? Uh, immigration and elections. And, and so we know that many of us are working in isolation on issues that are deeply interconnected. And because we don't get a chance to talk to one another very much, we have no idea that other people have similar passions, just like working in a different space. And so uh, Sister uh, Florence and Sister Michelle and Sister Sharon have been participating in this project where we can expand our belonging uh, ideas to include one another, but it has to start with relationships and some intentionality. And so we're excited to start bringing that online here at The Way. They've been getting trained the last, what, three, four, Months. months, and so they're belonging experts. Somebody say amen, right? And uh, I think it'll be a great, great blessing. So clap your hands for it, Sister Florence. I thank God for her. All right, Sister Helen. Hey, y'all, I'm Helen. Um, I've been at The Way three years, yes. from Nashville, Tennessee. Nashville, Tennessee. Um, so I'm really excited. We're continuing our live group. It's the Alameda Live Group. We also meet Wednesdays at 7 p.m. It's a soft seven. We like, to, we like to welcome one another. So if you're concerned about getting there on time, we love you and we will <laughs> accept you. Um, uh, so I'm especially excited for this series because my brilliant and spirit-led roommate, Tyler Brewington, um, really our group started from a vision that she had on her heart around reconciliation. It was very specific. Reconciliation with others, with self, with God, with society. And that's a lot of what this series has to do with. So we're feeling like it's a lot of... Um, aligning with like the heart that led to us starting this small group with this particular series. So we are amped and ready to go. Um, for our group, we just really love doing life together. We have celebrated together, grieved together, um, wrestled with a lot of doubts in a pretty honest way. And uh, we just are really glad to be in this walk together because I don't think we're built to do it on our own. Mm. So that's our group. We would love to see you. We're near the South Shore Center in Alameda and you are always, always welcome. Great, great, great. Clap it up for Helen and Tyler. And close us on out, Big Matt. We, uh, so I, I co-lead with Chris, and we uh, lead the San Francisco Live Group, and we meet 7 p.m. on Mondays, right by the Glen Park BART. So, you know, very easy access for um, if you're coming through the BART. So I think we have a couple of focuses. The, the first one is, um, uh, being a San Francisco home for people who live on the other side. Um, and, um, and I think for me that's been very important because I think initially when I came before we had this group, it, it felt you know, like that was a geographic barrier to being part of the deeper community of this church. Um, one of my favorite traditions that we do in our group is every week we share highs and lows. Um, and I think that's just been amazing because people have shared stories of heartbreak or you know, losing jobs and then getting jobs again a couple of months later um, or moving homes or you know struggles with family um, and so I think it's just been like a very precious space for us to to build that that deep community and know what's going on in each other's lives um, the second thing for us is that um, I think a couple of weeks ago you shared uh, one of the the things about the ways dechurchification mm. did I say that word right yes dechurchification de somebody um, listens with yeah. me <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think for many of us in our group, we've gone through a period of deconstructing our faith. But I think what's equally important is being able to reconstruct that mm. faith in healthy ways. Mm. Um, and so I think that the group has been really a good place to do that. So for example, if you remember, I think two series ago, we were doing the um, Discipleship Essentials series. And one of the things we were talking about was worship and prayer. And I think some people were, you know, were talking about how they struggled with the traditional ways that the church has done worship and prayer. And then I think through other people sharing that, you know, the way I worship or pray is through art or through poetry or through walking in nature. And that's how I connect with God. Um, I think people have been encouraged that there are new ways to engage with God, even if you felt disappointed with the church in the past. Mm -hmm. Man, can I come to your group? <laughs> so Groups on Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, Fridays, and there's even a group on Saturday that uh, happens at Cafe Lil Layla here in Berkeley. And so if you go to the website, thewayberkeley.com, you'll and click on uh, connect, there should be a link around live groups, 
and you'll get a chance to really email each of these folks directly. We also will have uh, um, them ready to take sign-ups for the next couple of weeks, including starting today after church. And so I would just encourage you all, um, hang out and get a chance to meet some of these folks. If anything that they said interested you, we love for you to uh, get some uh, personal time with them today or in the next couple of weeks. We will be launching our groups starting the second and third week of October. So we have a couple of weeks to kind of get folks connected and uh, our preaching and teaching from the uh, pulpit and stage will actually reinforce much of what we'll talk about, healthy relationships, and I'll start that out a little bit today in the name of the Lord. Stretch your right hand forward. Let's pray a special prayer over all of our small group leaders. Ask God to bless um, all of us as we endeavor to build healthy relationships. God, we want to say thank you, Lord. Thank you for the gift of community. Thank you for the tools that you uh, make us aware of that can help us become much more healthy in our relationships first with you, ourselves, certainly one another, uh, creation, and even all of these systems and jobs and careers in which we are tied to. I pray, God, that this series will uh, be an illuminating experience for people in our church and in our families that we can indeed go deeper and wider in our relationships. And we ask you, have your way. Have your way in the leaders that will be leading and, and, and have your way in the uh, congregations, uh, members that will be joining. We say thank you in advance for a season of healthy relationships. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. Please clap your hands and let's thank God for these great servants of the Most High God. God bless you. Let's turn our attention to the biblical text today. John chapter 15 is where we'll spend our time in preaching and teaching today. The, the, the scriptures remind us very much so that, uh, particularly in the book of John, that we serve a, a God that is deeply uh, interested in uh, reminding us about his care and concern for every part of our life. Uh, the book of John is one of the gospel narratives and recounts of the life and ministry of Jesus. John is one of the youngest disciples uh, thought to have followed Jesus. Uh, John is thought to have been around 16 or 17 years old when he first heard Jesus compel folks to come and follow him. Uh, so John was following Jesus as a teenager. One of Jesus' disciples as a teenager, uh, some, uh, you know, may question, where was John's parents at? Amen. Because I don't know my parents let me follow some homeless rabbi around. <laughs> it's like, boy, take your tail. Go do your chores. Clean your room. Uh, but I don't know. The words of Jesus was quite compelling back then. Somebody say amen. Um, and, uh, of course, uh, John was thought to have been in the inner circle of Jesus, which uh, is a fascinating paradigm that even we here at The Way attempt to uh, mirror as we describe our relationality both to God, to church, and to one another. You know, uh, if you've gone through our uh, uh, kind of onboarding classes here at The Way, The Way 101, you may recall this, but that there are always circles of engagement that we try to uh, kind of describe as we are working out a more rigorous and intelligible discipleship paradigm. That when you look at the scriptures, you find that Jesus often speaks in general to folks who first find themselves in the larger crowds. And as Jesus makes a convincing kind of argument and invitation, people move from the crowds into what in the scripture is described as the 70 people that, that are kind of uh, making a decision to, to use parts of their life to, to take on special assignments to accomplish these tasks of spreading the good news of the kingdom. And then you have folks who move from the crowd to the 70 to the 12. And those are like the disciples that just walked around with Jesus. And those disciples, we argue, are folks who say, you know what? I actually want to serve beyond just a periodic uh, moment of, of assignment. But I want to spend more time in a deeper kind of committed 
uh, uh, walk that is about, say, leadership in ministry and leadership in church or leadership in community. And then you have folks who move from the 12 to the three, James, John, Mary, uh, 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 Peter, uh, these folks who kind of uh, are, are like, you know what, Jesus, we're going to be with you wherever you go. And some of those folks would be like people we think who are like called to be ordained in ministry and like every day of their life they are doing the sacred call of trying to pastor and provide ministry and, and spiritual leadership to, to the church of God in the world. And so we have the crowds, we have the 70, we have the 12, and then we have the inner circle or the three. Does that make sense? Three or four. That we are always being called by God to continue to draw closer in our service and relationality with God and one another. Does that make sense to everybody? And so the book of John is one of these kinds of, of, of gospel accounts that take very seriously this argument that John was attempting to refute as the youngest disciple, John happened to live the longest. It is thought that John lived almost to the year 90 uh, of the first century, and he was exiled on an island called Patmos. It was like Alcatraz. It was like a prison island. Uh, they didn't call theirs Alcatraz. They called theirs Patmos. Ain't that something, right? And, and John was there, and John wrote the book of Revelation, many people thought, on the Isle of Patmos. Why? Because John was attempting to try to put and pull all of these things together. One of the great things that John uh, was attempting to fight against was this idea uh, that many of the folks in the first century could not reconcile the, the ministry of Jesus and their assumption about God. And so they had these ideas that, you know, there is nothing redeemable. This is what some folks in the early church thought. Nothing redeemable or good about the human body. And because of that belief, they then began to say, since nothing is good about the human body, Jesus must not have been human. Jesus must have been a spirit or a ghost. He just appeared to be human. And so this early uh, teaching was greatly starting to uh, uh, penetrate some of the theological conversations in the early church. And so John began to spend a chunk of his years attempting to say, no, the body is good. And God uh, was indeed uh, bodily represented or bodily showed up as Jesus. And, and so you can have a fully human and fully God expression in the world at the same time without diminishing the value of either God or humanity. That was like such a revolutionary teaching back then. But it helped me as I was thinking about this sermon to just fully appreciate how many of us can have these presuppositions about ourselves or about our bodies or about God. And because we can't reconcile many of these things together, we will have so much dissonance that we will limit our imagination about what God can do in us, through us, with us, because we come to our relationship with God and one another with these presuppositions that God is never limited by. And I want you to know it's good news that God is not limited by our presuppositions, our thoughts that may have been baked or cooked or handed down to us. I think I got a couple witnesses in here that God continuously expands our imagination about what can be and what can be done because that is just how great God is. You ought to give your neighbor a high five and tell him, I serve a great God. I serve a great God. I serve a great God. Yeah. And so the text today is, is one of these many times where John is capturing Jesus describing himself through the language of nature. Why? Because John was attempting to show that God in God's divine power decided to fully empty himself, the theological term for that is kenosis, into a human body. And that human body, uh, of course, Jesus is the manifestation of the fullness of the Godhead, dwelt bodily, that God in Jesus, Jesus in God, the same thing, have power over all of nature. 
And so John used all kinds of examples of Jesus, like the, the scripture where uh, Jesus walked on water and told the storm to be quiet. Like that's found in John, right? That's a pretty good story, right? Because it kind of helps you to realize, man, as the disciples said, what kind of man is this that even the nature obeys him? Yeah. Or when, 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 when Jesus raised uh, Lazarus from the dead and Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. You kind of like, wow, what kind of what kind of man is this that even death has to obey, right? And so you find all of these descriptions, and this is one of these descriptions that I found to be quite compelling as we start a conversation about the ties that bind us. A conversation and series on relationships. John chapter 15, verse number one. It's on the screen. Uh, and certainly you can look in your own phones or read along. But this is what Jesus is teaching the disciples literally weeks before he is taken to be crucified. Jesus is trying to help his disciples appreciate just who he is. Jesus says it like this. I am the true vine and my father is the vine grower. My father removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. And every branch that bears fruit, my father prunes to make it bear more fruit. And, uh, you know, I don't know if we have any folk here that, like, work with plants or grow things. What's the word for that? Gardeners. But there's another word. Horti no, horti ain't that something? Horticulturist. Is that what you call Hor hor Horticulturalist. Or just horticulture. People that work with plants and things. You know, if you've ever had a plant or you've worked with plants, I've been told that sometimes in order for a plant or a tree to keep growing, you have to cut some things off some branches and things off to help make sure that the nutrients that are coming from the roots don't get so uh, dispersed among branches that may not be productive or may be too heavy. And if you don't cut those things off, they could actually threaten the whole tree. That's what I was told, you know, when I was preaching this a couple times. Um, and actually, I was in Texas uh, at, at, at uh, Wiley College, and I was staying at the president's uh, house. He got this big old mansion, and so I was staying in one of the rooms. And, and we came out the next day, and there was a tree that, I mean, a super, I mean, it was just a large tree overhanging the house, and one of the branches had fallen off. And so, you know, pretty much the whole tree was leaning now over the house. And so when the guy came the next day, he said, you know, this tree has not been groomed in decades. And because of that, the branch had grown so dry that the wind literally blew the branch off the tree and threatened the livelihood of the whole tree. And that is why the pruning process, it seems to be so important, because we can have all kind of things that are hanging on to us or to our country, or to our world that need to be cut off because they are threatening the livelihood of the whole thing. Amen. That's not even my sermon, but I just felt like I, I should say something like that. Amen, because it, it, it felt good to me too when I was thinking about it. All right, here we go. Uh, 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 verse number three, you, everybody say you. This you should never be uh, uh, understood as a singular you. In the text, the scripture is largely spoken in the plural. So rarely is God speaking to you individually. More than God is speaking to you collectively. But then you can still find yourself in the collective, if that makes sense, right? So everybody say, you, you have already been cleaned by the word that I have spoken to you. Verse number five, four, abide in me as I abide in you, just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. 
Some good stuff. Keep reading verse number five. I am the vine, Jesus says. You are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit because apart from me, you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. And I'm, on another Sunday, I'm going to preach about how, we, how do we not allow th that statement to perpetrate cancel culture. Because, you know, we got a lot of folk who just quick to cancel folk. Not realizing that you're probably the one that begin. Well, that's another sermon for another day. <laughs> but you know, it's, it's worth saying sometimes you read verses and they should get unpacked a lot more. We don't have time to unpack it today, but during the health relationships, we're going to talk about cancel culture because that's a problematic thing. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. So we're going to speak from the topic today, uh, uh, the ties that bind. Give your neighbor a high five and tell them we are connected. Tell them that we are connected. Bow your heads with me and let's pray. God, we want to say thank you, Lord, for the word that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. And please send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. And uh, I pray that it will rest upon the hearers and even me as I attempt to speak these eternal truths and principles. Lord, may it bless us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Uh, we are connected. Now, uh, it is a important talking about presupposition for, I believe, us to appreciate Dr. King's words, describe this the best to me. He says that uh, we are all tied in a single garment of destiny, uh, a, that we are interconnected through a collective mutuality, and that if something affects one person directly, it affects us all indirectly. This idea that we are all tied together is an important part of how you and I must begin to interrogate deeply the power and the liabilities of our relationships. And how can we use tools that come from God's word and other disciplines to help us strengthen our ties so our relationships can be life-giving. Because if we are honest, not every relationship you've been in has been life-giving. From the cradle to the grave, you're gonna have some relationships and be like, I don't know why God brought this into my life or why I discovered this if I could go back in time, like go back to the future and like, you know, just, 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 just miss the bus or, 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 or be sick that day or, 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 or give them the wrong number that time. If I, anybody can go back in time and be like, oh, I changed some things. But the reality is this, we can't go back in time yet. Amen. I, I'm, a, I'm a science fiction person, so I always hold out hope that maybe I'll be the one to go through the black hole, you know, like they do, and like break the time-space continuum. Uh, but until then, we stuck with what we got. Somebody say amen, right? And so because of this reality that we can't go back in time, all we can do is take what we have and improve build upon, learn from. This is a biblical truth. The scripture says that we should grow in the grace and the knowledge of God in Christ Jesus. 
that this growth is the process of self-discovery. It's the process of revelation. It's also the process of how we can be more faithful in the world and in our relationships. It is indeed the case that our relationships can often be characterized not by health, but by dysfunction. And some of that is because of the systems or the ways in which we have been formed to think about and live out relationships. In our current context, many of our relationships are strictly seen through hierarchy. And we work in systems that reinforce that hierarchy. Somebody say amen, right? Um, you know, churches, uh, uh, political spaces, academic spaces. Hierarchy is kind of the way in which many of us come into a consciousness about relationships. Patriarchy, we talk about patriarchy a lot, and even as we talk about it, you find that you, it's a struggle, particularly for us as men, to even be told we're patriarchal, like I get told by my wife and therapists and people I work with, you're patriarchal, I'll be like, ah! And, and I thank God that <laughs> they don't leave us, us men, because we can't hear the truth without getting freaked out. But, but even, even not understanding that the truth can set us free, too. Because like I tell cops, you know, the reason why we are trying to limit your power is because you have too much. And if you have too much power, it corrupts and it destroys. It's too big of a burden for you to carry. So I'm trying to take your power away. You should thank me. <laughs> of course, most cops don't thank me, amen. A few come to, up to me like Nicodemus in the night and be like, thank you, Pastor Mike, for doing what you're doing. I'd be like, it's all good, you know? I'm just, I'm just, you know, just trying to be faithful. Somebody say amen. Or you may be in relationships that are exploitative, right? Relationships where it's clear that you or we are being taken advantage of. And so all of these relationships, if they are set with these expectations or frameworks, how many of you know they can limit our ability to then replicate healthy relationships? Or dare I say, more life giving relationships. Because even in the dysfunction of all these relationships, thanks be to God, we are still creating life in dead places. But I believe that as we live and the more we engage in relationships, we don't have to keep trying to squeeze out of a turnip a little bit of oil. That God wants us to have abundant relationships, relationships that are overflowing with life. And when I think of a theological category that has been coming up most recently as I uh, look at the text and trying to help us rethink our relationships around uh, uh, families and marriage and, and our relationship to uh, the environment and to systems, the word that keeps coming up is a word called mutuality. That if you look at scripture, you see just as much as you may see relations of hierarchy, you also see relationships that are grounded in mutuality. This idea that if God comes to us, God rarely comes and, and uses, uh, you know, the, the whole like sleep, sleep chokehold. Anybody watch wrestling, ever watch wrestling? And they used to have the sleeper, it, you know, on the streets we called it murfed out. Like you get murfed out. Come here, remote. No, I'm just playing this. <laughs> but it's kind of like you get choked out into submission until you barely can breathe. And then you say, okay, I'm good. I'm good. Aren't you glad God don't get a good, I'm good from you like that? But many of us depend on that level of tapping out in order to have relationships. Wouldn't it be amazing if we rethought our relationships through a framework of mutuality? What does it mean for our relationships to be mutual, where God gives us choices and we can live with the choices that have been given to us, and God gives us a choice, and we can say yes or no, and then you got to live with your choice. Knowing that there's always grace and mercy. Somebody say mercy. Because you don't, you don't get, 
I didn't choose the right time every time. But my bad choices never cost me my life with God. Then when God says, I'm married to the backslider, I'm married to the ones that, that always be like moonwalking like Michael Jackson. I was practicing the moonwalk at home, but it, don't, it didn't look that good. So I just want you to use your imagination. Somebody say amen, right? That God is married to the folk who continue to retreat even after they said yes. And this mutuality, I believe, can be a way we think about how we are connected. That we are connected by God's choosing, by God choosing us, and us in return, us choosing God. And we are connected to each other by us choosing one another, and in return, we choosing one another back. Yeah. Hierarchy is not necessary. Patriarchy is not necessary. Exploitation is not necessary. Violence is not necessary. Force and coercion is not necessary in order to have healthy relationships. Now, the reality is because we live in a fallen world, many of our relationships will still have elements of these unfaithful realities. But our relationships should not be grounded in that which God is attempting to set us free from. And how does this happen? Well, I, I was reading uh, Augustine, one of the North African church fathers, and I, I love what he says. Augustine uh, 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 325, something like that. He says, for we, through praise, cultivate God. This is some good, rich language. Now, this is a North African church father wrote this in like 325. This is some good stuff. Man, I, th I think they was talking in a way we ain't talking no more. We cultivate God. I want you to think about this. My praise cultivates God. And God cultivates us. Mutuality, reciprocity. But our cultivating of God does not make God better. <laughs> All right? All right? So that, that means that our cultivating of God... Uh, as it goes in the direction of God is purely enjoyment for God. Yeah, yeah. Like God, I can, I can take it or leave it. How many of you ever say that? I can take it or leave it. But you really can't. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't need I take it or leave it. Then when you, <laughs> I wish I had it back, right? No. <laughs> Our cultivating of God does not make God better. Our cultivating is that of adoration, not of plowing. God's cultivating of us makes us better. God cultivating insists in getting rid of all of the seeds of wickedness from our hearts in opening our heart to the plow, as it were, of God's word in sowing in us the seeds of God's commandments and in the waiting for the fruits of godliness. Listen to this. For the word of God will be your adversary until it becomes the author of your salvation. Ooh, I think I almost hollered when I read that. I, I spoke in another tongue. You know, just a little quickening. Oh, like, ah, thank you, you know. Because it reminds you and I that God has a deep investment in our healthy relational connections. And it's great to know that God cares so deeply about our healthy relationships. I mean, it, it's great to me because relationships in this world are hard. Hello, somebody. And so what is the first thing that I think that relationships uh, in our series will attempt to, to teach us? That we must have relationships that cultivate the stewardship of ourselves. Everybody say stewardship of self. In the biblical text, verse number eight, we've read that you and I must bear much fruit and become my disciples. Now, stewardship is another theological word I want to keep introducing to us as a church because stewardship is different than control. In a world where we are taught and deceived to believe we have a whole lot of control, 
There are experiences in our lives that will teach us how little control you have. But it does not free you and I from exercising the power, though limited it may be, it is always enough power to take good care of ourselves. Stewardship of self means, particularly in this text, bearing much fruit, that God has given you the power, access to the tools you need to bear fruit and become. Everybody say, and become. Say it again, and become. Michelle Obama made a lot of money talking to y'all about becoming. She didn't make that up on her own. It's an eternal truth that you and I are always becoming. The question I like to ask people is, what are you becoming? Who are you becoming? And how is that becoming making you more faithful to the eternal truths and principles of God in the world? And as much as it may sound limiting to some, it could be liberatory if you think about power not being absolute as something you must exercise. Do you know how much of a burden it is to be thought of as someone with all the power? You then take responsibility for all of the problems. You know, in my organization through the years, you know, uh, you know when I was not you know, the highest person on, uh, or one of the highest people in, in our executive leadership, I was always ready to talk about the man. You know, the man. Oh, y'all, the man is holding me back. The man is doing this. Oh, y'all so racist and y'all so this. Oh, I can't wait till this whole thing burns down. <laughs> and I was getting a lot of joy out of that, right? Oh, you know. And then I got promoted to be the man. <laughs> and then people think I got all this power. I'm like, I ain't got no power. Matter of fact, I don't want this title. I don't want this job. Send me back to like the, the other, other part, right? Why? Because when people think you have absolute power, they will assume you have the ability to change everything. When in reality, none of us. Everybody take a deep breath. If you are breathing, you have no power to change everything. <laughs> you know that. Definitely if you're dead, you ain't got no power to change anything either. So what's my point? You and I have limited power. No matter where you are, you should tell yourself that. Even if I got the CEO next to my name, I have limited power. But I am called to steward the power that I have. To be faithful to the principles of love, justice, peace, and righteousness. And so stewardship of self is about you and I becoming disciples with the power we have so we can have the relational ties that produce life and not death. What does it mean for you and I to be in relationships that help us be reminded that we must use the power we have to take care of ourselves? Self-care. Particularly here in the Bay Area where, you know, the cost of living would make us all think that I have to kill myself in order to live here. How many feel that pressure sometimes on your job, right? When you look at your bills, <laughs> I got to work until I drop just to make this work. And so power within your control or with that power that you are called to steward. See, I can't even talk about it that well because I'm just always used to control. But it is an important thing to rewire, I think, our brains that we are not called to control, we are called to steward, to influence, to channel, to faithfully use what has been given to us. So what's the first question? What ties, what connections, what relationships keep you from prioritizing self-care and agency in your life and the world around you? It's a heavy question, I think. Because some of our relationships, some of the ways in which we're situated can keep us from prioritizing stewardship of ourselves. 
How can a strong tie to the vine catalyze your branch to bear much fruit and healthy relationships? So the first point I just want to impress upon us over these next couple months, we're going to try to dig deep in talking about how can I and we be a better steward of the limited but enough power. Everybody say limited but enough. Say it again, limited but enough. Some of us, we, we on the wrong pole of that spectrum. Some of us are over here on the, I got all power. And then some of us are on the other side and I don't have no power. But God is saying, no, you have limited power, but it's enough. And whatever you don't have that you need, Mm, How many thank God for the Holy Spirit that can help cover the gaps? But that's my third point. I I, I, want to holler on that for a few seconds. Amen. So the second point that I'll raise is we must appreciate that the ties that bind us must emphasize interdependence with one another and creation. Everybody say interdependence. All right, so the first point was we are a people who must steward ourselves, but then the second point is about interdependence. The scripture says that the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. I want you to always remember that as Dr. King says, we are tied in a single garment of destiny, that there is mutuality, that our relationships are often either limited or set free by our ability to be an interdependent, mutual, healthy, relational networks. That you and I must find, as some say, our tribe. Find our collective. Find our group of folks who can help us be a better version of ourselves. And that interconnected network of mutual relationships that are life-giving will look different for each and every one of us. If you are an introvert, you likely will not have a network of interdependent mutual relationships that number in the dozens. (laughs) Because it's like, I'm not built that way. If I get around more than five people at a time, I need to take a nap for a week. Any introverts in the house? See, you wouldn't even raise your hand. I'm so introvert, I don't even want to raise my hand. You should just be glad I'm here at church. Somebody say, man, these people right now, this person next to me all up in my space and rubbing up against me and give me a high five. My introvert's like, stop touching me. <laughs> all right. But it's still the case that an introvert's network may look different from an extrovert's network. But it is still important for you to have a network. You are not built to go through life by yourself. The greatest example of this is nature right now. The whole environment, creation, is trying to holler to the radical individuality of the citizens, the global citizens of the consequences of thinking that what you eat and how you dispose of trash and you not being ecologically mindful is literally tearing up the ecological systems. If there's one great Uh, a warning to us about the danger of not living in an interdependent reciprocal relationship it is our ecosystem think of all the all of the different uh hurricanes there was a tornado in davis y'all yesterday i'm talking about a cyclone just people riding down the freeway and all of a sudden a cyclone tornado just whirling around And you know, folk driving, taking a picture of a tornado, I'm saying to myself, I'd have turned the other way. And I'm I'm, I'm, David said, God has called me to go another direction. (laughs) So driving, oh, look, oh, oh, this is not amazing. Oh my God, I'm saying to myself, what's wrong with these people? Fires. Maybe y'all remember when the fire happened here? A couple, maybe 18 months ago, all of us walking around with, 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 with these masks on. That's a result of ecological disaster. The Bahamas right now, 70,000 people reported displaced, homes destroyed, 
because the more stronger tornadoes, because of the rising of the temperature of water, all of these things are not disconnected, they are interconnected. Interdependence means that we must remember we are connected. And all of our relationships, even though they are connected, they change. I was sharing earlier this, this, this day about how, you know, my father and I, our relationship has gone through all kinds of changes. And those changes were not always peaceful, amenable changes. Some of those changes were very tough. You know, I went away to college uh, in 1993, 90, was it 93, 93, and, and, and you know, I was at UC Davis, and, you know, you go, you go away to college and you never appreciate how free you are, especially when you grow up in a house where there's a lot of structure. You know, you like, man, I can eat when I want to eat. I can eat what I want to eat. I can stay up as long as I want to stay up. I can come and go. I ain't got to ask nobody. I can stay out all night. I can sleep in as long as I want. And so when I came home for, for the break, I was totally reprogrammed about my autonomy. <laughs> and walking in my dad's house, it was a conflict. Man, I'll come in and like, you know, I don't know. Uh, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, midnight, oh, that's 12 o'clock, 11 o'clock, midnight, 1 a.m., and then be up at 6, 7 in the morning, out the door, in with my dad and them asleep, out before they wake up, and one day my dad caught me coming in, I said, son, my house is not a hotel. I was like, what are you talking about, dad? I'm, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just trying to go enjoy my friends. He was like, son, you're coming in and out. Uh, you, got, you know, we think Robert is coming in the house. We hear keys. We hear door slamming. I was like, dad, but I'm just trying to enjoy my life. And our conversation turned so tense because our relationship had changed. And how many of you know any relationship you're in over a long period of time will change? Hello, somebody. But you can have a changed relationship and still be interdependent. That just means there must be reciprocity, must be communication, and there still must be mutuality. As you and I keep asking ourselves about these interdependent practices, a question I have, what life-giving network of interdependence and mutuality are you tied to? Can you? inventory your interdependent life-giving mutual network of friends and family and appreciate that some of us may have relationships that are original meaning family relationships then secondary some of your friends homies booze partners and then you may have uh, chosen networks churches uh, 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 clubs all of these networks should be mutual and listen the networks should be both places you give and receive. But if you're in a network and all you do is give, that's not an interdependent network. That's the exploitative network. And if you're in a relationship and all you give is take, you a taker, guess what? That's still not an interdependent network. My prayer for us during this series is that God will give us tools to help us build interdependent networks find our tribes of life giving networks that makes sense everybody last point can't leave a church service without explicitly underscoring this point every relational healthy relationship must be grounded in dependence upon god dependence on god scripture says very plainly because apart from me you can do nothing. I want you to know that while some may see, see that as bad news, I see it as great news. Because it takes the burden off of us, off of me, to have to figure out how to do things that are not within my total power to do. Appreciating that my connection to God gives me what I need to do what I've been 
called or assigned to do. In the text, it's so important, a wonderful analogy where the scripture says that, that Jesus is the vine, that there is a source that you and I must remain connected to if all of our other relationships are going to work. You need a source greater than yourself. You need a source greater than your relationship. You need a source that can help cover the gaps when all of your energy has been depleted. You need a source that you can turn back to and begin to get wisdom that you yourself do not already have. I wish I had somebody who could remember what it's like to go to the encyclopedia. When you need, my daughter said, Daddy, how do I spell this? I said, did you look it up? I sound like my, my parents. Did you look it up? What does that mean? What does it mean? Look it up. How do you spell it? Go to a dictionary. Go somewhere to a source that has wisdom that you currently do not have. Don't you know that that is one of the great benefits of being in a relationship with God where I can depend and trust totally on someone and something, a tradition, a set of ideas that outlast me and my current struggles. I want you to know that when the writer says that Jesus is the I am, Jesus is pulling from a tradition that was even greater than his own presence in the world. Jesus was helping the disciples to go back to the law, to the Torah, when God made his first description and revelation to the people. And God told Moses, I am that I am. What does that mean? That it says that God, I will be whatever you need me to be. Give your neighbor a high five and tell him God will be whatever I need God to be. Jesus said it like this, that I am the true vine, which means that I got a source that you can be connected to, that you will never run out of the energy and the nutrients you need. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. What does that mean? It means that when you are hungry, Jesus knows how to feed those parts of you that can't be fed anywhere else. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. What does that mean? It means that when darkness is overwhelming you uh, that Jesus has the ability to turn a light on uh, and give you some hope where you thought there was none uh, Jesus says I am the door uh, what does it mean that when I find myself in a locked room and people have shut me out uh, God knows how to put a doorway in the middle of every locked room uh, I wish I had somebody uh, who could bear witness that God was my door uh, he he was my way out of no way. Uh, oh, I remember the old saints used to say that, uh, that he made a way out of no way. Uh, that was their way of saying, I am the door uh, that can give you a way out of your situation. Uh, somebody holler, he's the way. He says, I am the water. I am the well that never runs dry. Meaning Jesus is saying, when you're thirsty, when your heart is dried up, when your mind is perplexed, Jesus says, a drip drop of this water will help you never to thirst again. What is Jesus trying to say? Depend on me. Trust in me with all of your heart. And do not lean uh, to your own understanding uh, because I am the one uh, that can do anything but fail. Uh, somebody shout hallelujah. Uh, what are you trying to say Pastor Mike? Uh, I'm saying that this is a season uh, where relationships can be alive. Uh, they can be vibrant. Uh, they can be reciprocal. Uh, but you gotta keep trusting uh, and you gotta keep believing uh, and you gotta to keep seeking the power of the most high uh, because God can give you power uh, that can defeat every enemy in your life, uh, in your relationship, uh, in your family, uh, on your job, uh, in the neighborhood, uh, in the world, uh, at the White House, uh, at the mayor's house, uh, at the state legislature, uh, on your block, uh, in your mind, uh, in your marriage, uh, with your children God can give you what you need shout hallelujah the ties that bind stand with me everybody
the ties that bind, these ties that bind us together come from the God who has all power. And the God who has all power can give you and I what we need to take care of ourselves, to take care of one another, but stay connected to God. Grab the hand of someone next to you if you don't mind and let's invite God to give us a reminder of our connection. Someone says, I need you, you need me. We're all a part of God's body. Stand with me and agree with me, I need you to survive. God, as I'm holding the person's hand, I pray today that you will bless and strengthen them for this season of their life. I pray, God, that you'll give them a reminder that they have been given power. Though it may be limited, it is still enough, Lord God, to accomplish their given and said assignment. It is power to care for self. It is power to have agency and self-determination. It's power to influence their relationships. Lord God, both personal with you and certainly with one another. Give them the sense of interdependence, God. A network of mutuality. A network of interconnectedness. A network of life-giving people that can speak truth to them. Speak life and hope to them. Give it to them in the name of Jesus. And certainly, God, give them what they need to depend wholly on you, completely. God, what would it look like if we depended completely on you? God, help my neighbor, the person I'm touching, to explore and to imagine what complete dependence on you looks like. Dependence on your power, dependence on your strength, dependence on your spirit. In the name of the Lord, we say thank you, God. Lift those hands right where you're standing and say, I need you. I need you.